Hi everyone, my name is Jen Dabkowski with NOAA's Climate Program Office in Silver Spring. Um, coming to you from home today, um, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth in a series of the Managing Water Resources Along the Coast Community of Practice webinar. Today's webinar is um, exploring science and research topics relevant to that Managing Water Resources Along the Coast Community of Practice that is sponsored by NOAA's COCA, SARP, and Adaptation Sciences programs. I'm joined by several of my colleagues from the Climate Program Office, both Nancy Beller-Sims, who is the SARP Program Manager, and Luann Dahl Dahlman, who is a science writer with uh, NOAA's Climate Program Office, as well as several very uh, talented presenters that we are sharing with you today. Nancy and um, Luann will be handling questions in the chat box. So if you have a question, please feel free to um, share it in the chat box or the question box. Um, and we'll try to answer those questions um, in a timely fashion. Uh, we've got four presenters today and we're gonna do it a little bit less formal than we normally do. Um, so be patient if you don't hear your question asked right away. It's because we're um, doing it a little more uh, loosely than we normally do. Um, but please feel free to share your questions and um, we'll be happy to answer those again at, in a timely fa fashion. So um, I'm gonna introduce you first of all to one of the four presenters today. Uh, Benet Duncan is the Managing Director of the Western Water Assessment, which is a NOAA CPO RISA team, and it's university-based applied research program that addresses social vulnerabilities to climate variability and climate change, particularly those related to water resources. And the mission of the Western Water Assessment is to conduct innovative research in partnership with decision makers in the Rocky Mountain West, helping them to make the best use of science to manage for climate impacts. Benet works to understand how organizations and agencies use and produce weather and, water, weather and climate information with the goal of better connecting information with those who can use it in an ongoing way. She holds a BS in Atmospheric Sciences from the University of California at Davis and an MS and a PhD in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. So, Benny, I'm going to hand it off to you at this point, if you're available to join us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and I think James is going to be presenting our slides, so I'll just wait a second until that's um, opening yep. slide is showing. Just made him a presenter now, so you should be seeing it. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, we're really excited to share more about our recent efforts building partnerships for holistic climate change preparedness across the Mountain West. Um, and I just want to share this work was conducted with support from the NOAA Sectoral Applications Research Program. Um, and on a personal note, I have been so lucky to collaborate with these three wonderful other people that you see pictured on this slide. Um, we've got Julie Vano, who um, is with the Aspen Global Change Institute, Missy Stoltz, um, also with Aspen Global Change Institute and the City of Ann Arbor, and then James Arnott with the Aspen Global Change Institute. Um, and so before we get too far, I just want to walk you all through our flight plan for today. So uh, first, I will be providing an overview of our project goals and objectives. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Julie to share about our activities and approaches that we had planned to do, what our flight plan was. Um, and then Missy will share about some of the turbulence that we encountered during our journey in the form of extreme events, and then the adaptations or course corrections that we made. Um, and then finally, James is gonna bring us safely back home with our outcomes um, to date. So um, our overarching aim for this effort was to engage with scientists and climate service providers and champions within communities to prepare for new climate risks in the Mountain West, especially those in the water sector, but also looking beyond. And um, I'm just gonna break down three key objectives that we had for this work. Um, our first key objective was to build on scholarship and experience um, to reach and engage with new stakeholders, especially those within small and medium-sized communities. 
And in this way, we wanted to expand the circle to include communities that have more limited staff and resources or those who haven't been as well served in the past. Our second objective um, was to identify shared risks across the region, like increasing temperature, um, decreasing snowpack, and changes in stream flow finding. And once we'd identified these shared risks, we wanted to provide appropriate resources to help manage for those changing shared risks. Um, and we know that communities across the region are facing similar climate challenges, and we're anticipating that climate services could leverage those conditions of shared risk and find shared opportunities for developing and navigating um, to shared resources. This figure shows, oops, sorry, the figure shows a projected change in snowpack for the mid 21st century. And then the little green stars are just communities that we've engaged with through this effort. Next slide now. Thanks, James. Um, the third and, and final objective that we had for this effort was to explore how we can be better about sustaining engagement within and between uh, these communities, or I'm sorry, with and between these communities to help make them less one-off um, engagements and to cultivate peer learning. And um, let's see, before we get into um, what we actually did, I wanted to share with you um, who is, is joined today's webinar. So thanks to you all for um, answering those few questions when you registered um, for the webinar. And you can see that we've got folks from across the country. So not just the Intermountain West, the region where we focused on, which is really um, great to see. And there's also folks from a range of organizations um, you know, Western Water Assessment is an academic institution. So from a personal selfish perspective, it's really great to see folks from a wide range of organizations um, joining the webinar today. And um, with that, uh, I think we wanted to share a couple of um, poll questions to dig into your experiences. So, so we know, you know, where you're from and what kind of organization you work with. And so, uh, before we get too far into our flight plan and journey and experiences, um, we wanted to get to know your experiences. So our first question, if folks could just click on the link, um, menti.com that you can see in the chat window. Thank you, Luann. And then enter in the code that you see in the chat window. That's 11805106. And answer that first question that you see which is for me during the pandemic, sustaining relationships and expanding networks has been, and it's easier, harder, or about the same. So I'll just um, be silent and give folks time to, to participate in that. And James, you're the one who can who can see as responses come in. So I'll let you advance to to results whenever you think is is good. Yes, I'm I'm waiting for it to click and just giving it a couple seconds. Oops. There we go. There we go. Interesting. Yeah. These results are really interesting. It's kind of evenly split. Um, and I can see that because there's a lot of reasons for things for it to be harder. A lot of reasons where, you know, perhaps virtual engagement has made it easier to to um, reach out to and cultivate and sustain relationships um, virtually. And then, yeah, a, a fair number of you say about the same. OK, well, let's go to the next question. Um, and, and so in a word, uh, could you please describe the kind of engagement that you think is most likely to succeed? Mm, these are good words.
and we may not be getting, for some reason, we may not be getting all of the words showing up because um, I'm seeing that the one I shared isn't there yet, but um, maybe you just give one more second. Oop. Well, I love the animation in the words, if nothing else. <laughs> Well, these are these are great words, even if the others don't don't appear. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for responding. I think you know, equitable, deep, sustained, interactive, genuine, sincere. These are all, I think, approaches that we've tried to take to this effort, um, and fully agree that they're important. Um, well, with that, maybe let's see. It looks like James is going to see if we can make the words show up and. Didn't quite. So let's, um, I'm going to hand it off to Julie um, and she will share more about our journey um, on this project. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I um, thank you, Benet. And as Benet said, I'm going to talk about a little bit about how we flew. So, what activities and approaches we did. Um, this includes demographics we collected, several surveys we did some explorations into climate change portals and what we did to prepare for the engagement with these communities. So um, next slide. Um, so when we set out, um, we had kind of suspected that the number of communities, when we thought about small to medium sized communities, which were our, our target for, for this project was a bit larger than what we imagined. So we used census data to understand this better. And what we found was really revealing. So there were 11 communities that were bigger than 100,000. And there were almost 100 times more, so over 1,000 communities with populations under 100,000. And then again, as much when you think about including the unincorporated communities. So what this, this reveals is really this elevated importance of reaching out to these smaller communities, but also needing to do that at scale. So you can't reach out to over 2,000 communities individually. So what can you do that is at scale? Um, next slide. Also, when thinking about how do we reach these communities, um, we really wanted to engage those who weren't already a part of these conversations. So we didn't just want to look within our existing networks. So what we did was to reach out to clerk and recorder offices across this region. So county or city clerks exist in almost all of these communities and they help to manage um, the city or county's records. And we thought these people might be the people we could ask who in their community is involved in water management or who in their community is responsible for weather and or climate related issues. So we reached out and through this engagement, we got uh, uh, names of people and contact information that we then reached out to for further engagement. And you can see here, the dots on the map indicate the communities that we were, we got responses from. And then what we did was we initially engaged um, in a Zoom webinar. So this was the summer of 2019, so pre-COVID. So doing things on Zoom was novel at the time, um, but it gave us a chance to, to meet some of these, these people in these communities. And what we were planning was to gather a handful of champions from these communities together for an in-person convening. So next slide. So we're going through this effort to bring in people to have these conversations. What sort of information did we wanna provide them? So at first we were thinking we might wanna create our own tool or portal, um, but then we've decided um, let's, let's go take a look and, and see what sort of information is already out there. And as you can see, when we looked, there was a lot of portals that already existed. And just through a desktop analysis, we, we found over 30 different portals, and which is great. There's all this information there, but it's enough to make us pull our hair out, let alone somebody who's dealing with all the other pressures and concerns that water managers and city planners have to deal with. 
Also, we weren't quite sure if we captured all of the information out there. Um, so we were fortunate to connect with another effort um, led by Corey Knapp and Lisa Dilling, who were surveying people um, throughout the region who were involved in understanding resilience, adaptation, and vulnerability in the Intermountain West. And we added a question to their survey. And from that, we got 130 respondents and we, we found a total of 68 um, different climate information portals, which is twice as many as we had seen before. So really emphasizing the need to make sure that we provide the relative information that like, like how do these portals support the community's needs? And is there a way we can help them to navigate to the information that is most relevant and help to prevent them from pulling out their hair. So can we make this process of getting what information they need to help in their planning processes more easy? And so next slide. So fortunately, we were bringing all these people together that we would have an opportunity to have a conversation about this. And so we pulled together some information from the existing portals that we wanted to share and just get their reflections on um, what information um, was relevant and helpful in what they needed, what they were using in, in their processes underway or helping them think about adaptation. Um, so, so we were collecting things to share about climate information, but we also, um, next slide, realized there is a lot of other supporting resources. So it's not just all about the, the climate information, but there's resources about helping to navigate the appropriate information. There's resources on effective planning tools. There's a whole collection of or a whole lot of other climate service providers. There's a database of over 130 other providers that maybe we would match people with so that they could talk to somebody who's more local or is focusing on the issue that they care most about so we could help in that matchmaking. There's also examples of that illustrate how um, some, how you might go about thinking about what climate change means to your community. And one of those examples is Western Water Assessment has done um, a facilitated dialogue. So working closely with a community to understand what their risks and what their vulnerabilities are. So we were able to share that as an example of, of how communities might engage with this information. And then finally, there's also um, regional training opportunities. And this particular workshop, um, that that is highlighted here um, was something that came along a little later, but it's a really good example of, um, of Western Water Assessment put together a workshop that was on snowpack drought and water supply in the warming mountain west that we were able to share with the communities that we had engaged with so far. So they were able to, uh, to use that training resource as well. So uh, next slide. Um, so prior to our big gathering, we also um, said we were having about 20 different people come together for an in-person gathering in near Aspen. And what we wanted to do was to, to get a sense of who was all coming in advance. So we did have um, informal conversations with each of the people who were coming um, just to get a sense of to learn a little bit about their community and ask them what they're already doing in this space. And these conversations um, were with really busy people. One of the conversations I had, the, the water manager was waiting in line at, for his coffee at Starbucks, but we were able to just have a short um, touch base to understand what it is that he's really interested in learning at this workshop and what his community was already doing. And it gave us a chance to meet the people who were gonna be attending, but it also, importantly alluded to the resources these communities already have. So um, I won't be sharing all of these, but I would highlight the three that I have in red boxes as um, opportunities and things people are looking at at improving snow and stream flow monitoring, preparing for increased wildfire and fire prevention, and building an informed 
climate smart public. So these are activities that are already underway in the communities and it gives them an opportunity to learn from each other how they've begun working on these various adaptation uh, and ways to deal with climate impacts already. Um, next slide. So this all led to one of the first kind of aha moments, and that is don't create something new when you can leverage existing resources. And so importantly, this includes climate change information portals, um, but also um, there is other supporting resources that exist. There's other networks that already exist. And importantly, there's the work that the communities are already doing. So giving them a chance for peer learning is super important in, in the work that we do. So this concludes my part of the story, and now I'm going to pass it along. But um, before I do, where we're at is we're planning for this in-person workshop at the end of March, and then our lives got completely flipped upside down. So I'm passing it to Missy, and I would just say before I pass it, we were so incredibly fortunate to have Missy's perspective. So she's someone who is within city government, and she really helped us to navigate this strange and unusual world. And she's going to share a bit more about that now. Thank you, Julie. That was fabulous. And thank you all for letting us into your homes or your offices today. We're excited to be with you. Right, so our uh, plan in terms of our, our flight path, things were things were going okay. We were learning a lot. Uh, we were uh, agile. We were shifting as we needed to shift. And then we came across many, many extremes that we needed to navigate. And of course, we're looking at extremes, so we felt pretty comfortable until, go to the next slide please, James, thank you. Here we have this tool pr proliferation that Julie just talked about. Okay, we can, we can navigate that, we can leverage like you just heard, and then we have COVID. So COVID strikes, and we've got massive extreme changes to our jobs, to how we function, to who we function with and who we're serving, to pivots, uh, to vulnerabilities being laid bare in our healthcare system, disparities that exist within our systems, the intersectionality of that work with climate that we all care really deeply about uh, sort of came bare. And of course, we have extreme events that are happening in the region, right? We had another record setting year with billion dollar disasters. We had wildfires. We've got water issues in the region and these were all palpable in 2020 yet again. And so our communities were experiencing excuse me, experiencing these impacts. And we also nationally had really deep, hopefully sustained and meaningful conversations about racial inequality, about systemic racism and institutional racism, about how our systems perpetuate inequality, and of course the intersectionality of that inequality with the things that we're talking about. We had uh, perhaps a crisis of democracy as we thought about what was happening within our system. We had, uh, questions about our voting and our our right to have our voices be heard that were laid bare. And we have the layering of impacts. So this is just an example of uh, COVID screening during an extreme heat event, 115 degrees out, and we're doing COVID testing, right? But we also had food shortages that were experienced by people in our communities. We had uh, the extreme events like we just saw with COVID. The disparities, who's impacted first and worst by COVID just happens to be in almost every case, the people that are impacted first and worst by climate change and extreme events. And we're still seeing the cascading impacts from this. We're seeing issues now around housing. Uh, many of us in our communities are really deeply concerned about a housing crisis and a homelessness crisis that we're on the cusp of. Uh, some communities are already in it, others are coming. And so these things that felt perhaps at one point in time somewhat different are now deeply connected in practice. And we know that, and we heard that from the participants, and we felt that as individuals participating and leading this work ourselves. Next slide, please. So I just want to share a little bit uh, more specifically about kind of the shift that happened. In almost an instant, for many of the practitioners that we were engaging with and for ourselves, Job responsibilities changed. I bet they did for many of you on the line too. Um, in our case, our water managers and our sustainability folk in these communities became emergency managers or care coordinators. 
They were supporting healthcare. They were doing education and community engagement in a way that they hadn't done before. It was more around vaccines. It was more around uh, public health standards. They became essential employees and so much more. I myself became responsible for all care, dependent care in the city of Ann Arbor, where I had to help our police officers and our firefighters make sure that their aging parents were taken care of or their youth were taken care of when school systems shut down or when nursing homes couldn't take any more patients. And so we became more than what our job descriptions were. And many people had to balance things that they never were trained to balance. Um, and they still had to keep doing the work that they were doing. So this was a really real, authentic, raw moment for many of the practitioners. In this moment, we also saw conversations with folks where we were questioning how we engage with the public. The traditional means of doing this work, whether it was through our project or whether it was the individuals doing the work in the communities that we were partnering with, asking questions about who do we engage with and what different mechanisms are we using to reach people. And let's talk about the concept of resilience in this moment. Most of us think about resilience as coming together and supporting each other. A pandemic rips apart uh, the kind of social streams and seams for many of us. And so how do we support our systems given that reality? And I would argue we saw a really explicit connection between climate and inequality. And this is something um, I'll pivot to in a second, but I want to queue up. I saw one of the folk uh, when we did get the responses to what engagement looks like, someone mentioned equitable. And that's a really important point of conversation. And one thing we see in practice is that's no longer optional. For folks that have been on the front lines of this work and are working in water and working on sustainability, equitable engagement and equitable outcomes are now centered in the work in a way that is much deeper and more authentic than I would say it was even 15 months ago. Next slide, please. So this led to our aha. Our aha was we need to be doing preparedness work holistically to weather many extremes, not just weather extremes, but to weather social extremes, cultural extremes, pandemics, uh, you know, rectifying racial inequalities that exist. And I wanna pivot here as I'm about to hand it off to James to say one of the things that we've been sitting with as a group uh, that had the pleasure and the true honor of being able to do some of this work is that we are all white, affluent, and really well-educated individuals. We all hold PhDs from uh, esteemed universities, and we've had opportunities that many, many people have not had. So as we're looking to do this work, as we're looking to build the preparedness of our systems to the kinds of impacts that are coming, again, whether they're climate or other, we need to really broaden who's at the table and who's making de decisions. And that is something that we're deeply committed to. And James is going to tell you a little bit more about that, as well as the broader institutions and structure, uh, structure for helping to leverage. Thanks, James. Oops. Thank you, Missy, and uh, and to all my colleagues who came before. I'm bringing up the rear to talk just a little bit about where we've landed for now, um, and essentially some of the destinations that we got to in our collaborations thus far that were expected, and some that were unexpected, um, and and some that are still ongoing and emergent. So, hearkening back to some of the objectives that launched us into this effort to begin with, um, we. I think saw a lot of our aspirations uh, bear out um, even more so than we would have imagined in terms of reaching out and engaging those we didn't already know, uh, the clerk and recorder survey and others that we encountered along the process widened our scope of the range of relevant actors that are working to prepare for extreme events in the water sector in communities. These are water utility managers for sure, but also climate action leaders and sustainability leaders that may be working in different departments and helping to um, build awareness and conditions for action across a municipality. And they are interacting with other sectors in public health and planning and land use, et cetera. And so there's um, this I idea about casting a wider net, not only in terms of the sectors, but also in terms of trying to make inroads to smaller, medium-sized communities um, was something that we were able to start, um, but it's still an ongoing piece of work. Uh, we identified uh, shared risks that were um, many and deeper than we would have imagined at the outset. Uh, not only the 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 big the, the big three that we expected at the beginning: rising temperatures, diminishing snowpack, changes to stream flow timing. 
um, but how um, those are uh, layered on top of uh, uh, fire risk and air quality, COVID, economic uncertainty, inequality, and injustice. What I'd like to focus a little bit more on now is how we have built a platform that will hopefully enable us to keep With one another. So some of you may have heard of the Western Adaptation Alliance before. It started in 2010 and it was a group of 13 cities, primarily in the southwest, primarily large uh, cities in more arid regions of the mountain west, uh, that came together under the auspices of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network and started a, essentially a peer learning community, supporting each other and discussing areas of shared concern that were unique to Western communities that were maybe different than, let's say, other coastal communities that were part of the uh, sustain Sustainability Directors Network. However, due to funding lapses and changes in the network, it started to hibernate around 2015 and was uh, more on a hiatus status by the time that we were getting started with our work in 2019 and 2020. And as the um, virtual workshops that Julie and Missy mentioned uh, were starting to take place through the auspices of our work, participants in those exchanges started to remember back to those that had the opportunity to participate in what we call the WA mentioned it as a great example of something that already had some uh, startup capacity but didn't have any way to take it to the next stage and so one of those participants was ashley pearl with the city of aspen who had been a member of the wa and she raised the idea during a meeting that we had in june about how climate service providers could support communities doing climate work in the midst of covid she said wouldn't it be great if we were able to connect this effort um, with the hibernating WA. And so she reconnected me to Vicki Bennett, who is the sustainability director at Salt Lake City. And what was really interesting in that conversation is Vicki already had uh, a, a network developed through her prior work with the WA. And we had developed this network that was spanning across a broader range of sectors and making inroads into small and medium sized communities. And she said, we would love to get reconnected and form reform the peer learning and support that we had several years ago and to reinvigorate that in the midst of the pandemic when we're feeling a little bit isolated and challenged in the new responsibilities that we're all dealing with and i came to the conversation saying well that's great what do you think about expanding that out to be more than sustainability directors and to reach out broader throughout the region and to engage smaller and medium-sized communities and sh and she was totally on board with that um, and so we started um, holding, um, continuing the discussions that we had um, begun in March with a wider range of, uh, of individuals that were eager to reconnect um, under the umbrella of the law. Uh, since that time, Vicki has actually retired and passed the baton to uh, some new faces that are going to help keep the law going into the future. Uh, and it became this great opportunity to take the work that we had been doing that was funded over a, a, a grant timeline that actually ended in September of 2020, um, but to keep it going um, and to provide some, some light backbone support to the network with managing the mailing list and the Zoom feed and so forth, um, where we started again in September, um, taking a look at these broader issues that were concerned both within the water sector and beyond, including wildfire risk and air quality, uh, thinking about how communities can finance uh, the implementation of adaptation actions um, and also bringing it back to the water sector to dive deeper into the action areas um, that are emerging in terms of what water utilities can take to prepare for climate change. And in each of these meetings that I've highlighted here, we paired someone within the network, a, a, a WA member 
with someone that could bring expertise from outside of the network, whether that is from a consulting perspective or from uh, another research area. And that's proven to be a successful model that we're continuing throughout the remainder of 2021 and hopefully beyond. The other effort that emerged as a more sustained platform for this type of engagement has taken the shape of the Mountain West Climate Services Partnership, which was a nascent idea at the time that Benet and Julie and Missy and I started collaborating with one another. And the idea behind the partnership was to take stock of all of the promising effort happening around the Mountain West region to expand the access to and use of tools and services that could support communities in uh, planning and implementing resilience-based strategies in our region. And so we've had this idea of forming a, a foundation that forms connective tissue between these organizations. As Julie mentioned earlier, NOAA did a study in 2016 and found that there were at least 139 climate service providers uh, ostensibly operating in the region. And over the last several years, we've started, we've been holding quarterly uh, Zoom calls to uh, build and expand the membership to capture uh, uh, more than a dozen of those organizations that are really leading the way in the region. These are federally supported climate services organizations like the RISAs and the CASCs. There are other nonprofits, there are research institutes and other universities that have centers for providing relevant climate information to communities. And our platform, the way that we're conceiving of doing climate services in partnership um, is that first and foremost, we are a coordinating body uh, that helps to support peer learning between institutions that have their own relationships, their own missions, their unique identities, but can learn from each other and um, wherever possible, build synergy between existing efforts. We also brainstorm ideas of what we want to do together to meet needs that we've already identified. And this, some of the work that we've described in this webinar is an example of subsets of the partnership coming together to proactively develop supporting resources or to engage uh, with uh, different types of communities. Um, and also to be a door that, that one can knock on um, where we can grow and adapt our capacity to provide climate services across our organizations that respond to needs that are communicated to us rather than us going out to communities alone to predict what those needs might be. And so this actually thinking about the um, the journey um, that has been taking place with the the partnership and the WA leads me to our last aha moment for this webinar, uh, which is to embrace the confluence of the many activities and interests and priorities and knowledges and approaches that are taking place within our region to try to build resilience. It, in thinking about this aha, I was reminded of this beautiful place in the Mountain West, which is called Echo Park, which is a really famous location in um, the history of conservation. Um, but it's also a, a beautiful location where the wild Yampa River meets the highly managed Green River. And you can actually see these two streams coming together. Um, and I think this evokes a lot of the kinds of confluences that we've been um, navigating in the last year, um, whether that's bringing the worlds of research and practice together or um, the worlds of grant funded timelines together um, with the actual conditions on the ground and policy and practice, um, or whether it's the, um, the different identities and functions of a network of practitioners like the Western Adaptation Alliance or a network of climate service providers like the Mountain West Climate Services Partnership. Um, we are we are kind of pursuing uh, similar long-term objectives, um, but have different needs and different um, kind of inter uh, interim trajectories that we navigate together. And um, and and certainly, I think this um, it, you know speaks to uh, the holistic. This idea of embracing the conflicts it speaks to the need to embrace this more holistic approach to preparedness that Missy. He spoke to so eloquently before. And I think that embracing this confluence is relevant 
for the broader conversation that is happening about climate services in our country uh, as we anticipate uh, not only uh, burgeoning demand for climate services in conjunction with an outpouring of federal resources to support state and local governments in building new infrastructure and greater resilience across the country, um, but also in terms of the growing desire to supply climate services from uh, research organizations, uh, for-profit providers, and, and, and others. And there's been a lot of really exciting conversations, both in the academic literature. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a hearing on Capitol Hill uh, virtually about the building a case for a federal climate service and building an equity. Um, and um, actually more popular attention to the concept of climate services um, in, in the press um, that we can now see, such as a recent op-ed in The Hill. Um, and a lot of these conversations are pointing to, first of all, how can we scale? How can we build on existing capacity, which is so important if we think about that, that factoid about the 139 climate service providers in the Mountain West? How do we make it navigable? so that there is, as Beth Gibbons from the American Society of Adaptation Professionals mentioned during her testimony on Capitol Hill, that there is no wrong door to knock on, despite many and varied needs. Um, and that, uh, as Kathy Jacobs and Roger Street argued in their recent article, that it's intersectional, that, that climate services is not a domain unto itself, but it is proactively linking to and supporting efforts on other societal goals, whether it's equity or sustainable development. Um, or other priorities. So our work very much continues, uh, both through the Mountain West Climate Services Partnership, through our quarterly meetings. We're developing um, a new um, interactive database of resilience actions um, that can be searchable and embedded in different community websites. Uh, Julie is leading an initiative on helping to develop a guide to all those portals that she mentioned earlier in her talk, the, the ones that, the navigation that that tends to pull your hair out. Um, and Clemus, uh, one of the partnership members, is working with ASAP, the Society of Adaptation Professionals, to run a climate services academy to help train up and engage new entries, entrants into the marketplace of climate services, particularly from the, um, the private sector. Um, and then in parallel, and oftentimes in conversation with one another, the Western Adaptation Alliance of Community Champions across the region is continuing to meet bi-monthly and seeking to expand participation step-by-step -step to include additional practitioners from the water sector, but also from emergency management, public health, uh, environmental health, land use, and other domains. Um, and if you'd be interested in hearing more about this or, or think that you might be someone that um, should engage with one of uh, one or both of these efforts, please reach out to us at climate services at agci.org. And with that, I will um, pause for questions for any one of the panelists. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, James. And thank you also to Julie and Benet and Missy. Um, I have Luann and um, Nancy pulling together the questions for all of you. Um, and I wasn't sure if um, all of you wanted to be on camera or if you wanted to be off. Either way is OK. Um, Nancy, do you have any questions in the chat box or do you need a moment to pull things together? Um, no, we actually have one question here. Um, and it's from Brittany Brand, who's asked, how do you think about and manage the depth versus breadth of the work you are doing when you're coordinating across so many diverse viewpoints and intersecting issues? Benet is also, uh, although she her, her camera isn't working, she is also a part of this panel you're seeing on here. Um, James, Missy, Benet, do you want to start? I can make it if you want. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I was gonna. Well, good, Julie. Oh, go ahead, James. Go ahead, Bene. Bene, go ahead. <laughs> it's hard with my camera not working. I can't. We can't coordinate on who's gonna speak. I'm so sorry. I don't have the visual signals for people. No, um, I think that's a really fabulous question and it's a really hard question and I think it's something that um, all of us 
think about in in climate services, right? Like there's just always going to be more demand um, for what we can do uh, than than our capacity, or at least you know right now demand far exceeds capacity. I think for a lot of climate service um, providers, and on top of that, it's this depth versus breadth question, and so. Um, I think for for me, or speaking for maybe Western Water Assessment, um, we we often hear kind of uh, similar challenges across communities. So if we hear, you know, from multiple communities or multiple stakeholders about a particular challenge or a particular type of information they need, or you know, um, a difficult decision that they're navigating that other communities are also navigating, that's usually like the the signal to us that that's really worth engaging in and then the other thing i would say is um the really wonderful thing about having this partnership in place and having our, our network of, of connections to other climate service providers as well is that you know when somebody needs something when there's a potential to work um, on an issue that maybe doesn't perfectly align with our skill sets in-house or that is going to a level of depth that is just not something that we have the capacity to do. Um, we're able to kind of point to other connections, um, other nodes in our network, um, and other partners to help meet those needs, even if we can't meet those needs ourselves. Yeah. Just I would, to, oh. <laughs> well, I'll go really quickly. I think those opportunity for peer learning is huge in this space. So you have to dive deep to understand what the needs are, but then maybe by connecting with a few communities and as they are connected with others, like things can get spread more, but providing those opportunities for peers to get together and engage is, is important to be able to do that. Missy. I don't know that I can add much other than a finer point, like just kind of really honing in on the, the importance of networks and the fact that this work is both deep and broad. And so having really sustained relationships with different kinds of organizations, acknowledging that sometimes I'm going to pick up the phone and just call James, even though there might be a really great climate service network, because I know James and I trust James. And that's okay because James is still connected to that network of other people. And so you, you really want deep, rich kind of fabric that's intertwined. So you have multiple points of entry, but a sustained ecosystem surrounding it. And that feels even more critical now when we're being pulled in so many different directions. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that um, I, I struggled with this. Um, well, I have struggled with this throughout the last couple of years um, because I think on the one hand, as, as the question alludes to, um, when it gets down to it, a lot of the actions, the particular actions to implement requires tailored, focused resources, attention, expertise, you name it, in order to succeed. I mean, you can't, let's say, you know, build a culvert um, without the right engineering capacity and the right understanding of, um, you know, storm intervals and so forth. Um, I think that, in, in you know, in some ways, the the intervention of the pandemic in the course of our work highlighted a potential role for um, us to play in the context of a kind of a co-production style of of engagement, where um, we became much more comfortable being a fly in the wall and letting the conversation follow where it, it where it went. Because you know, especially in the, in the context of a year ago in March and April, um, knowing what the right allocation of our resources was was not self-evident, um, and it really required, I think, a deeper um, layer of listening, but also greater flexibility um, to adapt to these seismic changes that were happening. Um, and and then I think hearkening back to what what has been said before that one, once very particular needs become established the fact that we have taken that step to, back to be flexible and listen invites more people into the conversation um, and helps to expand the partnership whether it's of climate service providers or other practitioners where then i think the root finding to the right deep layers of expertise 
is more accessible. I mean, there is that expertise out there, um, but um, reducing those transaction costs to getting to it um, requires a, a kind of um, different type of capacity that I think we started to focus more of our time and attention building relative to you know producing more maps and metrics and things of that sort. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question. Uh, Guillermo Giro says, thanks for your interesting presentations. Based on your interactions so far, what do you see as the greatest need among the communities you've connected with and does it have anything at all to do with the science? <laughs> That's a really good question too. Um, I, from, from my perspective, uh, again, like creepy ghost voice from the void, sorry everybody. Um, you know, in, in our experience at Western Water Assessment, and I think it, it's also borne out somewhat in through these efforts that we've shared here, but also through other interactions we've had with, with small to medium sized communities in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, it kind of depends on the place, but I feel like um, sometimes communities need, you know, customized climate information. You know, what are the temperature changes that they've seen in, in their community or, um, you know, projected changes in snowpack or whatever. But even more than that, I think the need that I'm seeing is at the intersection of climate science and social science. And it's, it's this um, identifying and prioritizing adaptation actions. So like, you know, we know the science is saying that probably X, Y, and Z is gonna happen. Okay, but what do we do about it as a community to ensure that we have a resilient water supply, that we can deliver water to all of our community members, that, you know, um, people can handle increasing heat events, that we are more resilient to um, wildfire. Like there's a lot of a lot of challenges that these communities are facing and they're common challenges across the region. And so what we're hearing a lot now is, yeah, okay, so what actions do I take and how do I decide which ones to pursue? That's another one that I fully agree with. And I just want to add some nuance around that, which is when I, and I'm going to put on the city of Ann Arbor hat right now, often I don't need a lot of climate science. I need partners in this landscape that can help me kind of navigate that space. And in terms of making decisions, we often know what we need to do scientifically, but that doesn't mean it's socially palatable or politically acceptable. And so that there's like a thought partner that needs to kind of navigate that space and figure out how we do the right thing, given the realities of the work and what that looks like. And, and that that's not one off, you know, that's not handing information that's figuring out the nuances of how we present that information and how we think about behavior change in this and how we deal with a, a mayor versus a resident who's going to interact with that information in different ways. And so that that happens through a trusted relationship and, and a deeper kind of partnership, which thinks when you get to breadth, uh, the breadth question that we had before. Yeah, I would. I mean, building off that, I think one of the, the big things that we heard within the communities was to help in building a climate smart public. So getting the resources in a way that they can share with their people to um, build the momentum to take action. That in addition to, to the case studies, so examples of how people have used that information to go forward or like, how have you put together a plan? What do those like? And so that peer learning becomes a super critical part of that as well. Okay, I have a couple of my own questions. You guys have, oh, is there more answers? Okay, well, these are my questions until someone else comes up with one. But um, so that was, it's really interesting to see what you guys have done as far as bringing all the different groups together in the region. Do you know if this is being done in any other region like this? I'm looking at Missy because I feel like Missy is the nation's brain trust for what is happening in every region. <laughs> I don't know that that's true. I mean, I, I'm seeing some elements of it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to piece together the, the holistic work that's happening in the Intermountain West. 
at different scales. I think, Nancy, if that was you, it, it's, I'm seeing it at different scales. Like um, in the state of Michigan, there's work that's happening, but it's not across the Great Lakes region. Or we're seeing really good work in Minneapolis to bring people together. Or we're seeing things in Southeast Florida where they're pulling you know, different parties together. But I haven't seen it at this kind of a scale. And that's exciting. Or we're seeing like community networks form across the Great Lakes region or across, across California, but it's not in partnership with the universities. But I, I think that there is some novelty here into what's being co-created with these different networks. Yeah, I mean, Nancy, I think that um, we see some emergent efforts happening um, that, um, you know, may be linked to um, ideas about sustained assessment, um, both in terms of what the National Climate Assessment is doing and their engagement in preparation for future assessments, as well as what um, is um, emerging from the Science for Climate Action Network, um, where they have different areas of trying to build uh, broader civil society partnerships. Um, in th there's there's that happening in the coastal domain and in the climate finance domain and in the water and energy sectors. Um, I think for all of that, it's a challenge of how to sustain it, which is um, is is the is the crux of the matter. Um, I think what we I I hope what we are learning as we continue to move forward in the Mountain West can be um, it can populate some lessons for broader application, um, particularly as we think the the questions on in the capital in the congressional testimony about the role for federal climate services. I think really speak to what is the role of existing um, networks and institutions that are maybe regionally based or sectorally based, um, and I'm hoping we can sort of pilot what that um, um, that kind of meso level of networking capacity is needed. We're not trying to be national, and it's also not hyper local, um, but um, kind of organized around some common principles of shared risks, reducing transaction costs, peer learning. Okay, the questions are coming in as we have to end this webinar. So I'm, I'm, I, there's tons of questions. So I'm going to encourage anyone who has questions to um, get in touch with you all. I will. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to um, turn this back to Jen Dubkowski. And thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Um, this is Jen again. And what I'm going to try and do for those folks that are asking questions too is if I can save the questions in the chat box before we actually close out the webinar, then what I'll do is share them with you guys afterwards and you can uh, address those individual questions. Um, I did also want to say thank you to all of you um, for a great presentation. And I did also want to want to comment that the two things that I really took away from all of this was the idea of the scalability, the navi navigation, and the intersectionality. I think they're those those three things for me really really resonated um, with uh, with all the work that you're doing. So um, I, I just felt that I wanted to say that and, and and mention that I thought that was a really great great set of points to make. Um, and I thank you all for your time today. Um, I know that this is a, a great project and I, I can't wait to hear what other results come out of it. Um, and thank you, Chibane, also. I'm sorry we weren't able to see you on camera. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us today. And um, for those of you that are participating in the call, also know that this is being recorded. So if you miss parts of the questions or parts of the webinar, you can um, find those later. We'll share those with everyone. So thanks to James and Missy and Julie and Binet for a great presentation today and all of the hard work you guys are doing in the Intermountain West. Um, and thank you all. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, thank Jen. You. And thank you all. And Jen, were you hoping to relay those questions now or offline? Yep, I'm going to copy them and relay them offline, James. So I'll, I'll okay, I'm trying to copy them now before I lose the thread. So. Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thanks. Guys. Thanks you too. Bye. Bye bye.